Well, good evening, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Um, we're going to open this study with a word of prayer. So if you can join me. The dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this past week, for the blessings, for the trials that are blessings in disguise. And um, we're thankful, Lord, for the things that we have been learning. We pray and we are thankful for each person that um, follows these studies and that's searching for truth. We know, Lord, that you want to come close to us, that we need to learn of you, to know and understand how much you care for us, and that we can uh, share that caring with others. We just pray, Lord, that as we read here about the past history in your church and uh, what you have allowed to occur for your glory, we just pray, Lord, that you can give us a wisdom and understanding. Help as we discuss these things together, as we read, that these things will be a blessing to us in our Christian experience. So we pray for the Sabbath. We're thankful uh, for the fellowship that we can have, even if it's not in person. And so we invite your presence here now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So this study that we're doing um ML Andreas and dealing with the meetings with the evangelicals in the 1950s. So I've reviewed this a few times, but sometimes people come in watching this video. And uh, so it's part of my experience reading the book Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin and knowing about these issues. And there's two particular issues um, that the church compromised on talking to the evangelicals, at least in their language. And that had to do, of course, with the nature of Christ, to say that Christ was did not really have our human nature. And then this issue of the atonement, is the atonement completed at the cross or is there an ongoing work of an atonement? And I think he does a good job, M.L. Andreessen. So one is Andreessen wrote two of my favorite books in Adventism. One is he wrote a book on the book of Hebrews, a commentary, which is really good. And another commentary, or not a commentary, but a book on the sanctuary, which is probably equally as good. I, I'm not sure which book I like better. And and for me, as, as a Seventh-day Adventist, when, when I read those books, it was a long time ago. It was uh, really uh, an answer to so many different questions that I had about Christianity in general, and Adventism in particular. So they were really helpful books. But here he's going to... What's the name, what's the names what's of the books? The, what's the name of the book on Hebrews that he wrote? It's called the Book of Hebrews. Oh, okay. Very simple. And, okay. and I think the other one's called The Sanctuary Service. And I'm, I think that's what it's, it's entitled by Andreasen. But okay. uh, they're pretty big, thick books. You know, well-written, well-researched. But anyway, he's going to address this, this point here, and so we're going to discuss it. So he says, the serious student of the atonement is likely to be perplexed when he consults the spirit of prophecy to find two sets of apparently contradictory statements in regard to the atonement. He will find that when Christ offered himself on the cross, a perfect atonement was made for the sins of the people. That's from Signs of the Times, June 28, 1899. He will find that the father bowed before the cross in recognition of its perfection. It is enough, he said. The atonement is complete. Review and Herald, September 24th, 1901. So you can see these two statements here. But in the great controversy, he will find this. At the conclusion of the 2300 days in 1844, Christ entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to perform the closing work of the atonement. That's in page 422. In Patriarchs and Prof Prophets, page 357, I read that sins will stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement in 1844. Um, and then page, page 5 of 358 states that in the final atonement, the sins of the truly penitent are to be blotted from the records of heaven. Early Writings, page 253, says that Jesus entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, or, or the most holy 
of the heavenly at the end of the 2300 days of Daniel 8 to make the final atonement. It shouldn't be the fine atonement. I'm pretty sure that word should be final. But it is a fine atonement as well. Okay, the first set of statements says that the atonement was made on the cross. The other says that the final atonement was made 1800 years later. I found seven statements that the atonement was made on the cross. And I have 22 statements that the final atonement was made in heaven. Both of these figures are doubtless incomplete, or there may be others that I've escaped my attention. It is evident, however, that I may not accept one set of statements and reject the other if I wish to arrive at truth. The question, therefore, is which statements are true, which are false, or are they both true? If so, how can they be harmonized? And when it comes to harmonizing statements, you know, uh, I run into to people sometimes who take a statement, um, you know, Adventists, and they'll take some statement by itself and any other statement that contradicts that statement, seemingly contradicts it, uh, they reject, right? That some people have a hard time recognizing that there are limitations in language that sometimes makes a, apparent contradictions. So sometimes what they will do is they will say, well, Paul was right here, but this other statement that he made is wrong. Or, you know, Paul was right, but James was wrong, right? So people are, are going to sometimes, you know, sometimes what I express, you know, I maybe don't express it as clearly or there's limitations in language. Um, but usually if I know that there's some issue, I'm going to clarify the point. Right. I'm not just going to leave it at that. And so sometimes people take a statement out just out of context and try to make it to say something that it doesn't say. So we have to be really careful in this. So when we talk about a statement being harmonized, we, we do it with scripture. We do it with spirit of prophecy. We do it with anything. People, people, people generally, you know, don't contradict themselves. Right. Sometimes they just don't express themselves in a way that that is clear. Sometimes it appears that we contradict ourselves. I remember one time, you know, uh, I grew my hair long and uh, some people at church were wondering about it. And my best friend at the time, he was there when three different people asked me why I grew my hair long. And I gave three different answers. And he says, you know, why didn't you just like, why did you lie to some of them? Like, what's the what's the real answer? I said, well, all three answers are actually correct. I had more than one reason why I grew my hair long. But I different people, I told different reasons because of who that person was. So some of them I told, you know, a more humorous reason. And some I told a more serious reason. Right. So there's a humorous side to it. and There's a serious side to it. So so even when we when we communicate with people sometimes you know we we don't tell everything about a topic we, we say something because there's some particular point we want to make um but if that's to be examined or we're going to be cross-examined by someone you know they might feel that we we contradicted ourselves you know um well you said this another time to me why did you say that to this person sort of that and, and so sometimes it's the audience that you're speaking to. Sometimes it's the context in which you're speaking. And, and we all know this, right? We all know that we, we, we say things that in a certain context we mean, but we wouldn't mean it in another context. Okay, so, so things have to be clarified. But some people don't like to do that. Some people look for contradictions as a way of rejecting something that rejecting either what that person is saying completely or rejecting that person. And and I don't think that we should do that with people. We shouldn't make a man an offender for the for a word. Right. And and we need to be uh when we're communicating with other people, we need to we need to be um gracious in how we and, and if somebody says, you know, says something that we, we think that, that it's wrong or whatever, and, and they we have to give them an opportunity to explain it. I've had many times where people, I said something and somebody says, well, you said such and such. 
And I said, well, I didn't mean it that way. Well, words only have one meaning. And this is what they said, which, of course, is not true. Right. Do words only have one meaning? No, they have lots of meanings. Right. So, you know, you can't make it a man and an offender for a word. But it's also the same with the spirit of prophecy. You have to be gracious and, and look at how she clarifies things. And so and the same with the Bible. OK, so anyway, Andreasen goes on. Um, and of course, anybody can comment anytime they want or ask questions. Correct me. I was perplexed when in the February number of the ministry in 1957, I found the statement that the sacrificial act of the cross was complete, a complete, perfect and final atonement. I really just turn my dinger off my phone. Now, this is in distinct contradiction to Mrs. White's pronouncement that the final atonement began in 1844. I thought that this might be a misprint and wrote to Washington calling attention to the matter, but found it was not a misprint, but an official and approved statement. If we still hold the spirit of prophecy as an authority, we therefore have two contradictory beliefs. The final atonement was made at the cross, and the final atonement began in 1844. So he's going to look at the definition of atonement. Now, atonement doesn't mean at one minute, um, even though some people use that. Uh, it's not really what it means. But anyway, let's look at, at this word. But I, I'm always people always tell me that. But that's just uh, false etymology. It sort of can mean at one minute, but that's not where the word comes from. Anyway, I've listed to several discussions of the meaning of the Hebrew word kafar which is the word used in the original for atonement, but have received little help. The best definition I have found is a short explanatory phrase in Patriarchs and Prophets 358, which simply states that the atonement, the great work of Christ or blotting out of sin, was represented by the services on the day of atonement. So we can see here that when we're dealing with this day of atonement, which is in the scriptures, um, Ellen White is connecting it to the blotting out of sin. So, you know, obviously that's going to be a huge part of understanding what atonement is. This definition is in harmony with Leviticus 18.30, which says that the priest shall make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So one of the things we see here with atonement is that it's really about cleansing from sin. Now, that, of course, can bring us into union with God, right? Which is what people try to say atonement means at one minute. But you can see here it's really about cleansing us from sin. Atonement is here equated with being clean from all your sins. As sin was the cause of separation between God and man, the removing of sin would again unite God and man, and this would be at one minute. Right. So you can see how what's necessary to bring us in harmony to God is the removal of sin. Now, why is that important? Why do we need to have our sins removed in order to be united with God? Well, we have a new a new nature, new character. OK, character. We don't necessarily need a new nature. I mean, we do eventually get a. A, a new nature but first our character has to change but why why is this necessary isaiah 59 2 said but your iniquities have separated between you and your god and your sins have set hid his face from you that he will not hear so the word has to stay down as the word isn't it yes so so our sins have separated us now god is holy as uh, lucy has pointed out there um and now the word holy in scripture, um, it's usually uh, from the word kadash or kadesh. And, and it, it's, it's also, it, it means to be, to set something aside or to sanctify it, right? Sanctify is the same kind of idea. And so God is holy. That is, he's separate from us. He's, he's different than we are, right? Now we were originally made in, in God's image, but God is unlike us. And in order to have fellowship with him, we have to have our characters changed. Now, God loves us, right? We know that he created us 
to have fellowship with him. But we have, uh, and, and, and when we look at sin, now, now how does sin defile us? Uh, let's, let's ask that question. What does it mean to be cleansed of your sins, from all your sins? When, when God cleanses us from sins, are we still sinning? We don't have the we don't have the habit habit of sinning. Okay, well, I mean, well, I don't think it's just about a habit of sinning. I mean, to be cleansed from our sins, ultimately, that ultimate cleansing, we're not going to be sinning in heaven, and it's not because we get a new nature, right? Adam and Eve had a perfect human nature. Did they sin? They sinned, even though they had a perfect nature, right? So having a perfect nature isn't going in and of itself isn't going to stop you from sinning. And Christ took upon himself our nature and fallen condition, and yet he did not sin. So, so when we look at an atonement to be cleansed from all of our sins, the blotting out of sins, often uh, I've seen people talk about, okay, in, in, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jacob's ladder, Christ is the ladder that connects heaven and earth, right? He's fully God and fully man. There's something that's happening in heaven because something is happening on earth. Can God just magically wave his hands and us all be cleansed from sin? God is molding eight people now, and um, it's 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 the same as we we we're following Jesus' footsteps. Isaiah fifty nine, sorry fifty seven. 15, I think, is a good example. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabited for eternity, his name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. I believe that's going on now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of my scripture songs, by the way. Well, okay. I, didn't, I, hear that one. I did write a scripture song with that verse on my first scripture song album. Um, I did a sermon on that song, on that verse. <laughs> Jeff, you had a comment? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, so so God, he dwells in a high and holy place, but he also dwells with us. That is, Jesus is, that's why Jesus became fully God, or not became, that he's fully God, that's why he became fully man, so he could connect heaven and earth. And, and he did this to redeem humanity. Now, some people have the belief that God, well, there's different types of beliefs. Um, you know, there's a thing called forensic justification, and there's um, legal justification, and there's different theories. Some people believe that God just chooses some people to be saved and some people to be lost. So some people are going to be in heaven and some people aren't, just because God arbitrarily chooses who he's going to save and who he's not going to save. There are some who believe that um, that we're not really saved from our sins that, you know, God just pretends that we're righteous so that we can go into heaven. You know, he just looks at Jesus and, and, and there's some truth to that in some ways, right? Because all of us have sinned, right? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that means we will have had been sinners prior to entering into heaven, but we're not going to continue to be sinners in heaven. Right. We will not continue to sin on earth either, Theodore. I think that's the, the biggest part. Well, right. Well, well, the, the, because if we were continuing to sin, now, this has to do with the issues of the great controversy, which which is all a part of this. So we know that um, uh, God's character has been maligned by Satan. Satan's the accuser of the brethren as well. So he's an accuser, and he accuses God, and he accuses God's people. And Christ uh, temporarily takes the responsibility of sin upon himself. So God is not responsible for sin. In some ways he is, because he created us and he gave us a free will. So in some ways he's responsible. But he's not responsible in a moral sense. This this is something I know is always very controversial, Theodore. I've had lots of arguments about this. When you say you have to stop sinning, yeah, the, the Seven Day Adventist doctor um, believe that we'll be sinning till Jesus comes in the sky, and I say, well, how can that be? It doesn't make sense. But they say, well, we can't stop sinning. I say, well, 
Jesus said, uh, you know, he, he can forgive sins. So how do we, this doesn't make sense, but we have to, under, we have to live it. That's what life's about. Yeah, well, he can save us from our sins. And it's not just from the consequences of sin, but from sin itself. Because sin is definitely not a friend. And I mean, that's the whole reason I'm a Christian is I want to stop sinning. Now, that's, you know, easier said than done. We, we all know it's not just, you, know, you don't just say, well, I'm, I'm going to stop sinning and then it just happens. You know, there's a struggle that goes on because there needs to be a transformation of character. Right. So so God is willing to cooperate with us if we're willing to cooperate with him in changing our hearts. And it is something that's real. It's not just an imaginary thing. It's not just in the record books of heaven that God blots out our sins and forgets about them. Right. There is a point in which we also will forget about our sins, that they will be blotted out from our memories. We will not re remember ever sinning, right? So, so this blotting out of sins, this whole work of atonement, of removing of sin, is, is not just a one event. There's lots involved in it. It's a, a process that's demonstrated in, in the work of the sanctuary, all the way from the offering, all the way to the Day of Atonement. Um, so uh, Christ did not need any atonement, for he and the Father were always one. John 10, verse 30. Christ prayed for his disciples that they may be, may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us. John 17, 21. The definition of atonement as consisting of three words at one minute is by some considered obsolete. But it never let, nevertheless represents vital truth. Mrs. White thus uses it, says she, unless they accept the atonement provided for them in the remedial sacrifice of Jesus, who is our atonement at one minute with God. So you can see, obviously, though, that's not the real use of the word. It is um, like it's a false etymology. It definitely describes part of that process. Right. It's something that, as you do, if we think about it, this is what we need with Christ. You know, we can we, we can learn to be one with Christ or we can lead to learn to be a seven day Adventist. You know, we're not going to be saved if we're a seven day Adventist. We're going to be saved if we're one with Christ. We and, can't and we, be one with Christ if we have sin. Absolutely. And that's what we if we recognize that we can actually we have to make do our part. You know, Jesus can forgive us our sins, but he cannot confess our sins for us. We have to do that and we have to recognize that. And it's something that um, we all need to have this at one with Christ. As he as Jesus was one with the Father, we need that one with Christ. And if we, if we don't have that, we won't be able to do anything. We can't do anything because um, someone helps us do it. It's only God's Holy Spirit can help us do it. Right. So so. At, so to be in harmony with God, to have it at one minute, if you want to put it that way, is not something that man can do, right? That is, we can't we can't make ourselves united with God any more than we can just stop from sinning on our own, right? So this this is a work that God has done. So when we think about atonement, and people say, well, atonement is completed at the cross, well, it obviously isn't complete. Right. Because we're not at one with God. Right. So when people talk about atonement in that sense, they're not really understanding what atonement is. Right. That is, we throw around this word. Christians throw it around. You know, the atonement was completed at the cross. But yet we can see it's not completed. Right. Because we're not all in harmony with God presently. Now, of course, we know that atonement is more than just the unity with God. It's actually what what God has done um, at the cross that this is the beginning of a process. How, how how was Jesus one with God with the Father, Theodore? Well, he was one to him in purpose. He was one in in his obedience to his Father. Right, he lived a life of perfect obedience. Okay, because right? he came to be our example. So this is what we need to be following. And, yeah. you know, with his Holy Spirit's guidance, we can do it. But we need to do our part. And our part is you will seek me and find me when you search me for all your heart. You need mm -hmm. to want to do it. You know, so, you know I can mm -hmm. want to be a, a mountain climber, but if I don't go and climb a mountain, I'm not going to be able to do it. Yes. And, and we can see here then that 
that in this problem, when people start talking with this, when I come with this issue, okay, here's, here's part of the problem. You know, there's a guy commenting on my YouTube videos and it's sort of the same problem that, uh, okay. So Jacob's going to bring up a point here, which, which we need to do have some definitions, right? He says we can never be sinless in this life. We can and should sin less, but sin was created from the moment Adam and Eve ate of the tree of good and evil. Okay. So we're going to have to look at that point. So one is we have to understand what we mean by sin and what it means to be sinless. So part of the problem that we have here is that people have created definitions that don't come from the scriptures themselves. Amen. Right? So when Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect, is he asking us to do something that's impossible? And what about the 144,000? Yeah, but let's not go there yet. Let's just deal with this question. Is okay. Jesus asking us to do something that's impossible in the Sermon on the Mount? No. No. Because all God's biddings are enablings, right? In, in saying, be ye therefore perfect, Christ is speaking creative words. His words, don't they have creative power? They, they brought the world into existence. So they can bring in us a transformation that is impossible for us to have on our own. So we know Adam and Eve sin. Sin came into the world through one man, through the first Adam. And salvation has come from the second Adam. Christ came and brought salvation. And, and the question is, how does that come about? And so lots of times when people are dealing with this word, it's like even the word perfect, perfect. Now, Christ is not talking about creature perfection. He's not saying that um, if you do your math exam, you're never going to make a mistake on your math exam. You know, you'll always get 100% on every test you ever do, right? That would be creature perfection. That type of perfection is not possible in this world, right? But we can have a perfection of character. And, and even if we have a perfection of character, Definitely, if we do have a perfect character, we will not see ourselves as righteous because we'll know that anything that that comes from us is comes from our connection with God. And, and our responsibility is to see ourselves as sinners. Right. So so the problem that I found through the years, because I read lots and lots of Christian literature before I became an Adventist and I've read uh, lots of things after where. People argued about this point. And what I did is I just looked at what the Bible said. So, you know, Felix brought up a good quote here. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me or strengthens me. Right. So we know that we can overcome sin in Christ. We can't overcome sin in ourselves. But the question is, is something real. Do we under, really understand what what atonement is? What Christ came to do. That, that's the real issue. And I think that this has been something that has been so, so misrepresented, so clouded, that is all kinds of uh, garbage has been heaped upon this issue that the people often react to it because they've been pre-programmed to think that certain words mean certain things. But we need to define our words based upon the scripture. So so anyway, let's continue reading here. God's plan is that the fullness of that in the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Ephesians 1:10. And this is done, the family of heaven and earth are one. Desire of Ages 8:35. Then one pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. Great controversy 8:78. At last the atonement is complete. So He's going to go here into these two phases of the atonement. So much confusion in regard to the atonement arises from a neglect to recognize the two divisions of the atonement. Note what is said of John the Baptist. He did not distinguish clearly the two phases of Christ's work as a suffering sacrifice and a conquering king. Desire of Ages 136-137. The book Questions on Doctrine makes the same mistake. It does not distinguish clearly. 
In fact, it does not distinguish at all. It does not seem to know of the two phases, hence the confusion. The first phase of Christ's atonement was that of a suffering sacrifice. This began before the world was, included the incarnation, Christ's life on earth, the temptation in the wilderness, Gethsemane, Golgotha, and ended when God's voice called forth Christ from the stony prison house of death. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah is a vivid picture of this. Now, so when we think about this, this is one thing I think that is really important. Because when did the cross begin? Now, we see it manifested on earth when Jesus is crucified. But when did Christ begin suffering for sin? The Garden of Eden. Okay, I would even think before that. Because it I says think in, basically when that we're in the, the foundation of the world. Yeah, so he's the lamb, lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That is, even before sin began. Amen. This Oracle talks about the Father and the Son making a compact that if sin came into the world, basically the, Jesus would take, the, take the, the place of the sinner. Yeah, so. And, and we have a hard time understanding God in, in the eternity and all these types of things. But what we do know is that God in creating man recognized before he created man that, that he had to suffer. And not just the son suffers, the father suffers as well, right? The whole Godhead suffers because of sin. Amen. Before I had children... I understood that my children coming into the world would suffer because life has suffering. I didn't know how much they would suffer or when they would suffer, how long they would live, what their life would be like. But I understood on some dim level, because I was only 18, that, you know, having a child was not going to just all be happiness. I knew enough about life that, that, that there's all kinds of things that can go wrong in life. There's all kinds of suffering that can happen. You know, people can have mental illnesses. People can have other illnesses. Uh, lots of things can happen, disappointments. And yet because of love, God created man. And, and God has been suffering ever since. What we see at the cross is the suffering that God has experienced. God is not unaffected by our suffering. He is very affected by it. So you can see, you know, before before the world was. And this includes, of course, the incarnation. This was what was promised. So Christ in his whole life suffered, but he didn't have a happy-go-lucky childhood. And, and because he is love, he suffered. His care and compassion for others caused him to suffer as a child. Satan had overcome Adam in the Garden of Eden, and in a short time, nearly the whole world had come under his sway. It says away, but that should be sway. At the time of Noah, there were only eight souls who entered the ark. Satan claimed to be the prince of this world, and no one had challenged him. But God did not recognize Satan's claim to dominion. And when Christ came to earth, the Father gave the world into the hands of the Son, that through his mediatorial work, he may completely vindicate the holiness and the binding claims of every precept of the divine law. So that's from Bible Echo, January 1887. This was a challenge to Satan's claim, and thus began in earnest the great controversy between Christ and Satan. So we see that there is this, this conflict that's going on. You know, sin entered into the world through Satan in his temptation with Adam and Eve, and, and Satan claims to be the prince of the world, right, because of that. But we can see that Christ has come to counter these claims and to show that God is righteous, because that's what Satan is saying, that God is not. Christ and took because, the place. And because he did, we can walk in his footsteps, Theodore. If, yeah. we, if, we, if we can walk as he walked with uh, one hand in the, with the Father and the Holy Spirit's guidance, we can do the same thing. It's not that easy, yeah. but it, it's what, what he's to say well, to us, follow me. Yeah, God, God, God has promised this to us, right? So we need to understand this plan of salvation. And it's just that many people sort of skip over this idea of what actually Christ came to do, right? And that's why the nature of Christ is so important. Because if you don't understand the nature of Christ, 
you're definitely going to not going to understand the atonement. If you're going to think that Jesus came in a sinless nature and that he couldn't sin, well, then you're, you're not going to have very good understanding of, of what he did when he came to save us. It all ends up being more a play acting. It's a play acting that he just pretends, takes human nature, and he just pretends that we don't sin anymore so that we can be in heaven, right? That's what many Christians think. It's all just a game of pretend. It's a pretentious. I think think it goes a bit further, Theodore, because basically we look at what Christ did, but then we have to remember he didn't finish there. Uh, I thought, sorry, Revelation 1.8, I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. He is here but, to help us. As as he had the Father and the Holy Spirit helping him, he's here to help us. And he was tempted in all points like we are. So if we can understand that, you know, we're yeah. going to have to go through what he went through. He went through hell. Well, we call it hell, but basically he was one with the Father. So basically we need to be the same. And if we can stay as he stayed with his um, faith and trust in the Father, he can get through, we can all get through. Okay. Yeah. So Christ took the place of fallen Adam with the sins of the world laid upon him. He would go over the ground where Adam stumbled. Review and Herald, February 24th, 1874. Jesus volunteered to meet the highest claims of the law. Again, from that same document, uh, or I guess it's it's from Review and Herald, but September 2nd, 1890. Christ made himself responsible for every man and woman on earth. Again, from Review and Herald, February 27th, 1900. So Christ has taken the responsibility of sin upon himself. Now, how is how are our sins put placed upon Christ? How, how does that happen? John 1, 9. First John 1, 9, sorry. Okay, what's that one say? Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and friends that sense us from all unrighteousness. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, obviously, there was a confession made in the sanctuary when a, a, a person who recognizes that he has sinned takes an offering. He's going to confess that upon the sins of the animal. He's going to lay his hands on the animal and transfer his sins to the animal. And then he's going to slay the animal. And then the... The priest brings the blood into the sanctuary, and depending on whether he's an individual or a priest or a ruler, or if it's just on the behalf of the congregation, different things are going to be done with that offering, right, if, with the blood. But um, the thing is, it's symbolic, right? It's, it's when, you, when you deal with the sanctuary and you confess your sins, there's a whole bunch of symbolism that's being used. Like your sins aren't actually physically being transferred to an animal, right? Yes. Okay, right. Because we know one is that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. So it's pointing to something else. So Christ has taken our sins upon him. And and he's done this, right, obviously in taking upon himself humanity, our nature and its fallen condition. He's going to feel the guilt of sin, even though he never sinned. He's going to feel what we feel um, in humanity. But but we have to still understand that that this is something that, you know, there isn't some sins, like physical sins, that are put physically upon Jesus, right? That this still is an illustration of something, right? So we need to understand what that is. So obviously taking upon himself human nature and suffering and demonstrating his love is how he does this. He's going to bear the penalty for our sins, right? That's how he takes those sins upon him. Right? That makes sense? I think the other thing, Theodore, first, uh, first John, again, two, one, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the right. This is actually the beloved disciple. He's saying we sin not. So yeah. it's well, there, there's, there's the start, and that's you know if you want to be a friend with someone, you don't hurt them. Yeah, well, we definitely so, but, don't have any trouble with the idea that God wants us to overcome sin, and we also have uh, um, it's in First John as well. I think it's chapter three. Um, yeah, chapter three, First John, chapter three. Um, 
and and I suggest anybody read First John. It's a fantastic book. My brother Dave used to read it to me all the time. Uh, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And do you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whoso abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, so obviously, if we're looking at these, we're talking about statements that harmonize. We need to take all of the statements of Scripture and look at how, how the Scripture defines this. So, so obviously, we know that, that we are sinners. We're, we're, we're born in sin, right? We all have sinned. And we can't change the past. When we come to Christ, we ask him to forgive our sins. He takes the punishment of those sins upon him. But also in this exchange, Christ is beginning a work of transformation of our hearts, of our characters, so that we can be motivated with the same love that Christ had. Are we going to have, are we going to make mistakes? Yes. But are we going to willfully sin against God? No. Right? There comes, in our experience, however it is, and we're not going to know that it's happened, but we will have a transformation of character. And that's what God promises. But we don't look to that. We don't look at ourselves to see that. We look to Christ because we know it doesn't come from us. So so we can see that Christ has taken these sins upon himself. He's made himself responsible for every man. So as Satan claimed ownership of the earth, it was necessary for Christ to overcome Satan before he could take possession of his kingdom. That means Christ has to defeat Satan. Satan knew this and hence made an attempt to kill Christ as soon as he was born. However, as a contest between Satan and a helpless child in a manger would not be fair, God frustrated this, right? So obviously Christ had to continue to grow into a man, right, to be our sacrifice. The first real encounter between Christ and Satan took place in the wilderness. After 40 days of fasting, Christ was weak and emaciated at death's door. At this time, Satan made his attack, but Christ resisted even unto blood, and Satan was compelled to retire defeated. But he did not give up. Throughout Christ's ministry, Satan dogged his footsteps and made every moment a hard battle, right? So, Gethsemane. Uh, the climax of Christ's struggle with Satan came in the Garden of Gethsemane. Hitherto, Christ had been upheld by the knowledge of the approval of the Father. But now he was overpowered by the terrible fear that God was removing his presence from him. That's from the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 95. If God should forsake him, could he still resist Satan and die rather than yield? Three times his humanity shrank from the last crowning sacrifice. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance. Now that's from that book, page 99. As the Father's presence was withdrawn, they saw him sorrowful with a bitterness of sorrow exceeding that of the last struggle with death. Desire of Ages 759. He fell dying to the ground, but with his last ounce of strength murmured, if this cup may not pass from me except I drink it, thy will be done. A heavenly peace rested upon his blood-stained face. He had borne that which no human being could ever bear. He had tasted the sufferings of death for every man. In his death, he was victor. When Christ said, it is finished, God responded, it is finished. The human race shall have another trial. The redemption price is paid. And Satan fell like lightning from heaven. It's manuscript 11, 1897. As the father beheld the cross, he was satisfied. He said, it is enough. The offering is complete. 
signs of the time, September 30th, 1899. It was necessary, however, that there should be given the world a stern manifestation of the wrath of God. And so, in the grave, Christ was the captive of divine justice. I'm not sure what MFE stands for, uh, February 24th, 1899. It must be abundantly attested that Christ's death was real. Uh, so he must remain in the grave the allotted period of time. Review in Herald Lake 26, 1898. When the time was expired, a messenger was sent to relieve the Son of God from the debt for which he had become responsible and for which he had made uh, full atonement. Uh, manuscript 94, 1897. In the intercessory prayer of Jesus with his father, he claimed that he had fulfilled the conditions which made it obligatory upon the Father to fulfill his part of the contract made in heaven with regard to fallen man. He prayed, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Mrs. White then makes this explanation. That is, he had wrought out a righteous character on earth as an example for men to follow. Now, he, he could be commenting a lot more on these quotes, but he will explain some of this a bit later on. The contract between the Father and the Son made in heaven included the following. The Son was to work out a righteous character on earth as an example for man to follow. Not only was Christ to work out such a character, but he was to demonstrate that man also could do this, and thus man would become more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. If Christ thus could present man as a new creature in Christ Jesus, then God was to receive repentant and obedient, obedient men and would love them even as he loves his son. Spirit of Prophecy, volume 3, 2, 80, and Desire of Ages, page 790. Christ had fulfilled one phase of his priesthood by dying on the cross. He is now fulfilling another phase by pleading before the Father the case of repenting, believing sinners, presenting to God the offerings of his people. Manuscript 42, 1901. So here Ellen White is using uh, the imagery of Christ as our mediator in heaven. Now, th does the Father really need to have Jesus plead on our behalf? Like, is the Father in agreement with Christ? Yes. Yeah. So, so why is this illustration given in Scripture and in Spirit of Prophecy of this mediator? So that we would learn to trust in both the Father and the Son, knowing full well that Christ has gone through exactly what we've gone through. Okay. So so we know that, you know, um, that Christ is our comforter through the Holy Spirit, right? I'll send you another comforter. So Christ, that's a paraclete. That's an advocate. So, so Christ is our advocate. That is, we have the Father representing divine justice right and we have the son representing god's mercy is the father merciful yes is christ also just yes yeah so he also represents divine justice but they have taken upon christ has taken upon himself this role to take upon himself humanity to be the sacrifice and also to be our mediator because he bears Humanity forever, right? It's not something that he did temporarily. Christ now has our human nature. It's it's glorified human nature, the same nature we will have once we're glorified. But he developed this character, or he demonstrated this character in a fallen nature. And this is something that he offers to us. Because otherwise, there is no way that his work could be complete Right, because Christ can't just make people righteous. Like he made Adam and Eve with the fallen human nature, sinless, but they sinned. So that means there's something more that has to happen in humanity if we're going to be eternally secure in heaven. Right? It, it, to me, it's just very simple. It's not not a complicated idea, but it's not something that's commonly known. It's not thought through. Okay. In his, uh, let me see here, in his, car, in his incarnation, he had reached the prescribed limit as a sacrifice, but not as a redeemer. Manuscript 11, 1897. 
On Golgotha, he was the victim, the sacrifice. That was as far as he could go as a sacrifice. But now his work as redeemer began. When Christ cried, it is finished. God's unseen hand rent the strong fabric which composed the veil of the temple from top to bottom. The way into the holiest of all was made manifest. And that's um, uh, a quote that uh, Iran showed me before too, but it was not from manuscript 11, 1897, it was from some other place. But with the cross, the first phase of Christ's work as the suffering sacrifice ended. He had gone the prescribed limit as a sacrifice. He had finished his work thus far. And now with the Father's approval of the sacrifice, he was empowered to be the savior of mankind. At the ensuing coronation 40 days later, he was given all power in heaven and earth and officially installed as high priest. So we know, of course, Jesus was resurrected on the 16th day of the first month, the wave offering, right? And then 40 days later, he's going to send into heaven. He's going to, there's going to be his coronation. You know, he's going to, you know, who's the king of glory, the Lord of hosts, right? Christ enters into heaven. And then we know 10 days after that, uh, he's going to begin his work as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary when the Holy Spirit is poured out in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, right? So 50 days after he's, or the 50th day, really, after he was uh, resurrected, right? So the wave sheaf offering. So this work as our high priest is is all part of that work. So after his ascension, our Savior began his work as high priest. In harmony with the typical service, he began his ministration in the holy place. And at the termination of the prophetic days in 1844, he entered the most holy to perform the last division of his solemn work, to cleanse the sanctuary. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 265 and 266. On the same page, 266, Sister White repeats, apparently for emphasis, at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844, Christ then entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary into the presence of God to perform the closing work of atonement preparatory to his coming. The reader cannot fail to note how clearly and emphatically this is stated. John the Baptist did not distinguish clearly the two phases of Christ's work as suffering sacrifice and a conquering king, Desire of Ages, page 136 and 137. Our theologians are making the same mistake today and are inexcusable. They have light, which John did not have. In studying this part of the atonement, we are entering a field that is distinctly Adventist and in which we differ from all other denominations. This is our unique contribution to religion and theology, that which has made us a separate people and has given character and power to our work. Counsels to writers and editors, editors, page 54. In the same place, she warns us against making void the truths of the atonement and destroying our confidence in the doctrines which we have held sacred since the third angel's message was first given. Now, I've told this story many times, but when I first became an Adventist and I started studying on the sanctuary, uh, I wanted a commentary on the book of Hebrews. And so I went to uh, the Christian bookstore in Edmonton. They used to have a really big one, Canadian Bible Society had a huge one at one time. And uh, I went and looked at all the commentaries on the book of Hebrews. And none of the commentaries noticed that Jesus was our high priest, even when they're commentating commenting on the verses that talk about Christ being our high priest, they seem to miss it. And uh, I remember once uh, I had a guitar student. I went to, uh, I can't remember what it was. It was, I think he was going on a mission trip or something like that. And they had uh, a party of some sort. And I, I went to this party, my guitar student's party. And um, there was an old guy there. And he was talking with some of the young people about the sanctuary. He says, nobody knows that there's that Christ is our high priest in the sanctuary in heaven. Now, this guy was not a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, I think he was a Baptist. I'm not certain. But but he, he liked to talk a lot about the sanctuary and Christ is our high priest. And uh, I was kind of surprised, you know, because most Christians don't notice this. 
But this work, if you think about the sanctuary, because it's typical of the work of salvation, we know Christ came at his first coming to fulfill the spring types, right? Christ came and died at the time of the Passover. That's in the spring, right? He poured out the Holy Spirit on, on his disciples on the, on the day of Pentecost. That's in the spring. But the fall types, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, they are typical of the events connected with the second coming, correct? Agreed. Yeah. I remember there was this one uh, evangelist, and he, he had been a Pentecostal, and he became an Adventist. And this to him was the most amazing thing when he understood about the spring and fall types, uh, something that he had just never noticed before. And, you know, it... It's it's kind of interesting because it's once you once you see it you can't unsee it it seems so obvious but for many Christians they just have all of these things all are fulfilled at the cross right everything's you know the day of atonement's fulfilled at the cross the passover's fulfilled at the cross every single sacrifice now it is true the sacrifice is only done once Christ doesn't have to die over and over again but there's so many different sacrifices and so many different uh, symbol, symbols that are being used throughout the sanctuary that aren't all fulfilled at the cross. The sacrifices for each of these happens once. Does it make, I mean, that, that should make sense to us, hopefully, you know, as Seventh-day Adventists, but also to anybody, you know, watching this video who's unfamiliar. And, you know, and of course, I've been having discussions with people who have keep failing to see this. And even when I explain it to them, maybe they don't want to see it. I don't know. I can't always understand why some people persist in in, in uh, stating some of the things they do, even though I explain again and again that we don't think these things that you accuse us of thinking. But, you know, it's just sometimes it's difficult to communicate. So anyway, this is Vital counsel. And written for this very time when efforts are being made by some among us to have others believe that we are like the churches about us, an evangelical body and not a sect. Paul in his day had the same heresy to me. He was accused of being a pestilent fellow, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, Acts 24.5. In his answer before Felix, Paul confessed that after the way which they call a sect, so serve I the God of our fathers, believing all things which are according to the law and which are written in the prophets. That's Acts 24, 14 from the revised version. In those days, men spoke sneeringly of the true church as a sect, as men do now. Paul was not disturbed by this. We have no record that he attempted to have the church of the living God recognized as an evangelical body by men who trampled the law of God in the dust. On the contrary, whatever they might call him, and his sect. He confessed that he believed all things which are written in the law and the prophets, verse 14. So this was the thing that I found when I became an Adventist, is that generational Adventists, at least, didn't really like being called a cult. And, you know, I, I guess I kind of understand it. But the thing is, you always have to consider who's, who's name calling, right? You know, do you really have respect for somebody who's who's not going to take the time to understand? Uh, I remember when I first became an Adventist, I read lots of anti-Adventist literature, uh, you know, seeing what other people said. And um, I remember this one book, and, and, and it's still published. I, I'm always amazed that, you know, you can go buy this at Christian bookstores. But, you know, it talks about how Adventists believe in this uh, this prophet, Mary Ellen White, who uh, predicted that Jesus was going to come back in 1843. And when that prediction failed, she said he was going to come back in 1844. When that prediction failed, she says he came secretly to the earth. And um, there's all these things, he's like mixing up Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy, and, and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and, uh, and Mormons, and all these different things not understanding at all what Adventists believe. Uh, I always find, find it interesting that somebody, that's why if I'm going to learn about Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, I'm going to 
get the information from Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, not from somebody who, even somebody who's been a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. I, I mean, I don't necessarily trust them because a lot of times people have an axe to grind and they misrepresent. So if you want to know what somebody believes, you ask them. Simple. Plus also we know that people aren't saved by being in churches. They're saved by obedience uh, to Christ, right? So by their relationship with Christ, not by uh, obedience to a church or a denomination. So, so just because the, maybe the church believes some things, it doesn't necessarily mean what, it's what I believe, right? So he says, on the contrary, whatever they might call him and his sect, he confessed that he believed all things which are written in the law and the prophets. And that's what we need to do. We need to believe what's written in God's word. Uh, <clears throat> the religious journal Christianity Today states in March 3rd, 1958 issue, that the Adventists today are contending vigorously that they are truly evangelical. They appear to want to be so regarded. Mentioning the book Questions on Doctrine, it says that this is the Adventist answer to the question whether it ought to be thought of as a sect or a fellow evangelical denomination. It states further that the book is published in an effort to convince the religious world that we are evangelical and one of them. And of course, I, I don't, it's not something I'm really that interested in. I'm definitely not uh, a regular Christian. Uh, this is the most interesting and dangerous situation. As one official who was not in favor of what was being done stated to me, we we're being sold down the river. Uh, what a sight for heaven and earth. The church of the living God, which has been given the commission to preach the gospel to every creature under heaven and call men to come out of Babylon, is now standing at the door of these churches, asking permission to enter and become one of them. How the mighty are fallen, or how are the mighty fallen? Had their plans succeeded, we might now be a member of some evangelical association and not a distinctive Seventh-day Adventist church anymore. In, in, secretly sold, in secrecy, sold down the river. This is more than apostasy. This is giving up Adventism. It is the rape of a whole people. It is denying God's leading in the past. Now, of course, we know what happened in the 1950s. There still was a reaction to this and an attempt of the leadership to undo what had been done. And we saw this with, um, well, in the 1970s. Who was the conference president in the 70s? Pearson or something like that? Is that the name? Robert Pearson? I, what was the guy's name in the 1970s, the general conference president? Wasn't it the president? Uh, car, uh, pres uh, president, father? No, that was in the 80s. Oh. That was Neil C. Wilson in the 80s. I'm talking about the 70s. I think anyway, that's I, correct. You think, yeah. It's just that in Canada we had a, 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 a prime minister with the name Pearson. So I always think I'm saying it wrong. But anyway, <clears throat> okay. So, so anyway, in the 70s, conference president, Pearson, he, uh, you know, he did a lot to bring back historic Adventism to a certain point, right? But that eventually failed with Neil C. Wilson becoming the conference president. And of course, the huge influence that uh, uh, Johnson, the editor of the Adventist Review, had. So, so they'd already begun a work that was really hard to undo uh, within our the intellectual class within Adventism. Okay, it is the fulfillment of what the spirit of prophecy said years ago. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted an error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. Series B, number two, page 54 and 55. Now, of course, we recognize that this, uh, the books of a new order, 
uh, begin with the third generation of Adventism and uh, and close with the beginning of the fourth generation of Adventism. So we mark 1919 with the publication of a book, uh, The Doctrine of Christ by W.W. Prescott, where Prescott really wants to get rid of prophecy. He wants to focus upon Christ himself. But without prophecy, we, we can have an imaginary Christ. We need prophecy. And then the book Questions on Doctrine closes that period. So in that period of time, the church, in a sense, fulfilled this prophecy or this condition that Ellen White uh, says could happen, right, which did happen. Uh, be not deceived, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have before us the alpha of this danger. The omega will be of a most startling nature. So even in Ella White's day, we have the beginning of this with John Harvey Kellogg and, um, and of course, uh, the conference president at the time, uh, bad with names. I know his name. <clears throat> but uh, I just can't think of it. it. Drives me crazy. But we could see that that things were happening in a certain direction, and and a lot of it was happening behind the scenes. Much of it, you know, that at that time people wouldn't have known about. Over time, as we, you know, historians have dug up the letters and the different correspondence, and people have basically made confessions about what they were planning at that time. Uh, we can see that that the church ends up divided. The wheat and tares grow together to the heart to, until the harvest. So we see that, you know, we don't definitely don't have a perfect church, but it still is God's church, even though, you know, there's been uh, all of these things happening, and uh, you know, God's will is going to be worked out. So when men standing in position of leaders and teachers work under the power of spiritualistic ideas and sophistries, shall we keep silent for fear of injuring their influence while souls are being beguiled? Those who feel so very peaceable in regard to the works of the men who are spoiling the faith of the people of God are guided by a delusive sentiment. Again, this is from Series B. Renewed energy is now needed. Vigilant action is called for. Indifference and sloth will result in the loss of personal religion of, and of heaven. My message to you is no longer consent to listen without protest to the perversion of truth. We must first, firmly refuse to be drawn away from the platform of eternal truth, which since, since 1844 has stood the test. <clears throat> I hesitated and delayed about sending out of that uh, which the Spirit of the Lord impelled me to write. I did not want to be compelled to present the misleading influence of these sophistries, but in the providence of God, the errors that have been coming in, um, it must be met. What influence is it that would lead men at this stage of our history to work in an underhanded, powerful way to tear down the foundation of our faith, the foundation that was laid at the beginning of our work by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. Upon this foundation, we have been building the past 50 years. Do you wonder that when I see the beginning of a work that would remove some of the pillars of our faith, I have something to say? I must obey the command, meet it. So uh, Andreessen goes and comments on this. He says, all this was written to meet the apostasy in the alpha period. We are now in the omega period, which Sister White said would come and which would be of a startling nature. And the words are even more applicable now than then. Is the reader one of those who feel so peaceable in regard to the works of the men who are spoiling the faith of the people of God? Shall we keep silence for fear of injuring their influence while souls are being beguiled? It is time to stand up and be counted. There are times when I have been tempted to think that I stood alone as did Elijah, but God told him that there were 7,000 others. There are more then that now, thank God, they need to reveal themselves, and they are doing it. Most heartening are the letters I am receiving. It is with deep regret that I find I am unable to enter into extended correspondence. I am overwhelmed 
with the work. Okay, so we're going to have a bit more time here for commenting. I just want to read a few bit more here on this, and then we'll discuss some of this. Okay, Christ's death on the cross corresponds to the moment when the Day of Atonement, when on the Day of Atonement, the high priest had just killed the Lord's goat in the court. Uh, the death of the goat was necessary, for without its blood, there could be no atonement. But the death in and of itself was not an atonement, though it was the first and necessary step. Okay, Sister White speaks of the atonement commenced on earth. Says scripture, it is the blood that maketh atonement, Leviticus 17.11. And of course, there could be no blood until after the death had taken place. Without blood, administration, without a blood administration, the people would be in the same position as those who on the Passover slew the lamb but failed to place the blood on the doorposts. When I see the blood, said God, I will pass over. Exodus 12.13. The death was useless without the ministration of the blood. It was the blood that counted. So, so when we look at Christ's death on the cross, when Christ died at the cross, it was at the time of the evening sacrifice, correct? At the time of the Passover. Agreed. So Christ didn't die at the time that the Day of Atonement would happen. He didn't die in the fall. But his death on the cross still corresponds with the sacrifice of the Lord's goat on the Day of Atonement, correct? I hadn't thought of it that way. Well, every sacrifice in the sanctuary points to Christ's sacrifice. Now, I, I'm going to disagree with him, though, a little bit. So if Christ came and fulfilled the spring types, he came at the right time. And we're in the time of the fall types. What does the Lord's goat represent? Because it's on the Day of Atonement. It's not part of the, the yearly service. What what what? What was the cry that came from Christ's lips when he was on the cross? There's a few things, but one in particular. If it's finished into thy hand, I commend my spirit. It, how about my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who else is going to uh, quote from the first verse of Psalm 22? The 144,000. Yeah, the 144,000, that same cry will go from their lips. My belief is that the Lord's goat on the Day of Atonement represents the completed work of Christ in his people, because that is necessary to cleanse the sanctuary. So if we think about it, Christ comes in the spring types. He's, he's the sacrifice. And that, you know, and, and he represents all the sacrifices. So obviously he represents the Lord's goat as well. But he also has to have that work completed. So on the Day of Atonement, the Lord's goat, which has no sins confessed upon it, its blood is going to go into the sanctuary to cleanse it from all of its filthiness, right? So the blood's going to be sprinkled all over. Then Christ comes without sin, right? Because when he comes the second time, because those sins that have been cleansed from the sanctuary are going to be placed upon the head of the scapegoat. Azazel, which represents Satan, then bearing his responsibility for being the instigator of sin. So this idea, which is uniquely Seventh-day Adventist. Now, there are other people who have said that the scapegoat represents Satan, but many Christians think the scapegoat represents Christ. But the sanctuary has already been cleansed. And, and it's this this typology that really explains why Christ has not yet come back. There's a work that has to be completed. Now, we know that many people are going to die who who have, you know, not completed a work of character development. Right. They've begun that work. Right. But they still will be in heaven. How is it that they're going to be in heaven? You didn't have the opportunity to complete complete that. Yeah, so, you know, like the thief on the cross, he didn't have an opportunity to develop a Christ-like character. Right. You know, the, the one that, you know, Jesus said, I say unto you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Right. Um, and we've looked at this before, but Hebrews chapter 11, we know that the faith chapter, and, and this is sort of the, kind of where we're going to end 
today. But it's something I want you to think about. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do, do appear. That means things that are seen are made with things that do not appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Right? By faith, Enoch. Right? All of these people that did these things by faith. Right? So you got Enoch, we got Abraham. And, and it says in verse 13, these all died in faith, of course, except Enoch. Um, have not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Right. So obviously Enoch's not included there because he didn't die. Um, and then it's going to go through by faith, Joseph, by faith, Moses, all of these things that they did. And then just starts listing, um, you know, all the different things that happened to the Israelites. They passed by faith. They passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho came down. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a, a good report through faith, received not the promise. Now, why have they not received the promise? Tells us in the next verse. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us, should not be made perfect. So what's so all these people that have died in faith who are going to come up in the resurrection of the righteous. Now, Jesus has uh, some uh, samples, so to speak, of people from each generation that are in heaven now that were resurrected at his re resurrection, right? Talks about that in John. I'll just read to you from um, letter 203, 1905. Okay. Salvation in the last hour of life, hours of life. Some among the redeemed will have laid hold of Christ in the last hours of life. And in heaven, instruction will be given to these who, when they died, did not understand perfectly the plan of salvation. Christ will lead the redeemed ones beside the river of life and will open to them that which while on this earth they could not understand. Again, letter, letter 203, 1905. Right. So when we look at this issue of the great controversy, God is going to choose some people who we apparently would say, well, that person lived a terrible life. Why are they in heaven? And then there's going to be some people that, you know, appear to leave a, live a good life. And God's going to say, no, that person's not, not suit, suited for heaven. That is, God can judge the heart. He knows, he, he knows who is suitable for heaven. Right? So when he declares the righteous are righteous and the wicked are wicked, and the righteous don't turn from their righteousness, and the wicked don't turn from their wickedness. And then we have the, the seven last plagues. And the wicked don't change, and the righteous don't change. We know that God, we have confidence then that God can judge, that his, his assessment of humanity is correct. That final generation finishes a work that is Christ completes his work of atonement in his people. 
Do, do we see that? Amen. Yeah, that, that what Jesus accomplished at the cross has to be demonstrated. That it's real. That it wasn't just some make-believe where he, he pretended to take on human nature. He pretended to suffer. For those who have faith, we know it's real. But it has to be demonstrated to the wicked as well. Because the wicked have to accept their punishment. They have to be able to see that God is just and a justifier of those that believe us in Christ. So this this is this whole issue to me of the great controversy of what of the plan of salvation as understood by Seventh day Adventists has been so maligned, even within Adventism, that many Adventists don't know about this. I mean, we, we take it for granted, you know, those that study. But many people have come into the church and even people have been raised in the church and have never heard the gospel. And they live a nominal Christian life that is in name only. And, and we, we don't want to just be called Christians and take the name of the Lord God in vain. We're going to take God's name. We need to live as Christians. Doesn't mean we see ourselves as perfect. Doesn't mean that we're going to not continue to recognize things in our lives that need to change. Doesn't mean that we're not going to have a struggle with sin. Doesn't mean that we're sometimes uh, going to be overtaken by the enemy, caught by surprise and things that we're just not aware of. But those are all part of God's purifying work. He's allowing us to go through these trials so that we can develop a dependence and trust in him that will be unshakable for eternity. Amen. I think Andreessen does a very good job in what he's doing in this readings we're doing here, uh, Theodore. He's explaining yeah. and we can see the characters coming out here. And I've, I've read his book on a sanctuary too. And I, I recognize in it what I recognize in Alan White's book. There's, there's something that we have to understand that God God will guide us on this journey. Yeah. So I'm just going to read this uh, this paragraph before the blood atonement one, which is going to lead into it. But uh, it is the blood that needs to be applied, not an act, a great act, a sacrificial act, an atoning act, the act of the cross, the benefits of the act of the cross, the benefits of the atonement, all of which are expressed, all of which expressions are used in questions of doctrine. But any reference to the blood is carefully avoided. It is not an act of any kind that is to be applied. It is the blood. Yet in all the 100 pages in the book dealing with the atonement, not once is the blood spoken of as being applied or ministered. Can this be merely an oversight or is it intended? Are we teaching a bloodless atonement? Elder Nichols states the Adventist position correctly when he says, we believe that Christ's work of atonement was begun rather than completed on Calvary. Answers to Objections, page 408. This was published in 1952. We shall be interested to see what the new edition will say. Many are waiting to find out what they are to believe on this important question. So anyway, we will leave it there for now. Uh, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I was going to say, Andreasen did also write the book uh, Isaiah, the Gospel Prophet, which was a very yeah. good book as also. I didn't enjoy it as much as the other ones, but uh, okay. But you know, that's just it was a long time ago I read it. But yeah, he did write that one as well, which which I think he had actually written it in connection with the Sabbath School Quarterly, if I remember correctly. It was a study on that's right. That's right. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you. We know, Lord, that we are so. Uh, insufficient we are sinners that we can imagine that we can do good but we find that sin is waiting at the door we know Lord that you have a power that can change our hearts that you can uh, create new desires that that your love can fill us and it can be shown to others there's so much healing that has to happen in our lives, Lord. Sin has done a work upon us. But we know that Christ 
has come to redeem us and to bring us into communion with you. So we give our hearts to you, Lord. We ask that you can take them, that you can you can complete the work that you have begun. Help us to trust and entrust you with that work. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them. May you help us moment by moment, day by day. And we pray for the Sabbath. We pray that we can come together tomorrow and continue to learn of you. Give us a good rest. Bless each one, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.